Running a business in Philadelphia takes a lot. It takes strong, strong relationships, unique insight, and inspired leadership. It takes staying in the know and making the most of every opportunity. Everything it takes is everything you'll find at CCPA. A resource for business support, a chance to hear from experts in their field and get up close and personal with city leaders. An insider's guide to what's happening and what's next in Philadelphia. With CCPA, business is personal. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Women Changing the City. I hope that everyone is doing well and feeling a bit more optimistic about people coming back to the city and feeling that great energy. CCPA is an intimate and diverse group of business owners, executives, and managers looking to build relationships and offer each other meaningful resources. We take pride in bringing you unparalleled access to speakers, decision makers, and leaders who are shaping Center City. We keep our members and guests informed about business challenges and opportunities in Philadelphia. So let's take a minute and touch on the benefits of becoming a member, a sponsor, or collaborating with CCPA. We think it's easiest to remember as being Center City Smart. We have signature events where you get the inside scoop on development, sustainability, exceptional women leaders, and the city's movers and shakers. There are marketing opportunities that are available only to members and sponsors, which enable you to reach thousands of businesses and consumers. You have access to our speakers and panelists in a way few organizations can deliver. The up close, intimate, and personal experience of a CCPA event is like no other. You can reimagine employee benefits available to members through Kenworth Financial Services, and you can take the lead with opportunities to build your network, grow your business, and be a CCPA ambassador. So if you'd like to join today, there's a link posted in the chat. And to mark your calendars for our upcoming events, they are posted now on your screen. So please take note of those. A special call out for our next week's Lunch with City Leaders with Jeff Hornstein with the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia and our new series, Sustainable Philadelphia, Protecting Our Rivers on June 24th. For today's event, we encourage you to use the chat to ask questions or comment and connect with each other. You can also find a link to today's program there. I'd like to acknowledge our partners who support all of the work we do. Please welcome Peter Blau, Managing Director and CEO of IT Data, CCPA's Information Technology Partner. Peter, are you there? Peter, I think you're muted. I am sorry. Oh, there you are. I guess when I switched over from the other. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Suzette. Uh, we're honored to be a supporter of CCPA with all of their technology needs. Mostly, though, we're grateful to be a part of this powerful series and a sponsor of uh, Women Changing the City. IT Data has been involved in social impact causes for over two, two decades, and we are humble enough to know how important this work is. Supporting women leaders, diversity, and equity is essential to our societal growth, and it's all of our responsibility to set a high bar. It's women like these here on the panel today paving the way. Um, thank you for having us and enjoy the program, everyone. Thank you, Peter. And we would also like to thank our sustaining sponsor and our preferred benefits provider, Michael Craig of Penworth Financial Services. And we are pleased to collaborate with and welcome members of Crew Greater Philadelphia, the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Irish American Chamber and Network, and the Walnut Club. And we have several generous sponsors who make this series possible, Excelion, IT Data, PIDC, Temple University, the School of Sport, Tourism, and Hospitality Management, Rivers Casino, and a quick side note, Rivers Casino will be the location of our next Women Changing the City, and that will actually be in person in September, so that feels really great to say. And a special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Republic Bank. And now I'd like to welcome Republic Bank Regional Vice President, Matthew Skilton. 
Thanks, Suzette. Great news on the in-person event. Looking forward to that. Uh, on behalf of Republic Bank, good morning and thanks everyone for joining. I hope, uh, well, I guess soon enough we'll, we will see each other. That's just great. Uh, it's an honor to be here today on behalf of Republic Bank and sponsor today's panel as a CCP, CCPA board member as well. Republic Bank is one of the largest Philadelphia-based retail banks with over 30 locations located in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York City. At Republic Bank, we pride ourselves in supporting the entrepreneurs who help our local economies thrive through small business lending. Now onto the task at hand, introducing our moderator. Uh, Marilyn Russell is a host of Remarkable Women on 98 WOGL and a podcast, Eat, Drink, and Be Marilyn. With over 25 years of broadcast experience, Marilyn has been lucky enough to form incredible relationships with other female members of the media, public relations, music business, and the art community, as well as professional businesswomen from all walks of life. She currently profiles, highlights, and celebrates area women from the Delaware Valley in Remarkable Women program, airing Sundays at 30 a.m. on WOGL. By and those of the panelists are in the program, which has been posted in the chat. Please join me in waving a warm welcome to Marilyn and our panelists. Good morning, and thank you so much. I um, bounce in and out of Center City, but Philadelphia is my hometown always, and I couldn't be more proud to represent and help moderate this great women changing Philadelphia panel today. Um, I love CCPA so much that I actually crashed this party two years ago. I was so impressed with everything they were doing that I said, how do I get to be a part of what CCPA is doing. And Ben very graciously <laughs> said, well, at some point, maybe we could have you moderate a panel. And that some point is here. It took um, a lot of changes in a pandemic, but I made it through and I'm so excited. And I couldn't be more happy to work with this extraordinary panel that we have here for you this morning. Um, Margaret Berger Bradley is Vice President of Strategic, uh, or Vice President Strategic Initiatives of Ben Franklin Technology Partners. And we're gonna learn certainly more about Margaret and what Ben Franklin Technology Partners does. You'll be able to ask questions in the chat room, which we will direct exactly to the panelists you want to direct that question to. We've also got Jen DeVore, president and co-founder of Better Civics. I'm now following on Twitter, so you should too. Uh, this is how we all connect these days. Psyched for the in-person event in September. We've got Eleanor Hader, director, Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative for the Pew Charitable Trust and Jovita Hill, Executive Director, Office of Engagement for Women, City of Philadelphia. Thrilled to say Jovita was a guest on my program, Remarkable Women, which airs Sunday mornings on 98.1 WOGL. And I hope at some point, Jen, Eleanor, and Margaret will be able to join me. We love sharing um, extraordinary women with the City of Philadelphia, and we love being able to have an, you know, a, a playing field where everyone is represented, every voice is heard, and everybody's got something to offer. And certainly today is no exception. So everybody ready to start? Everybody had enough coffee? Ready to rock and roll? All right. You are four very accomplished professionals. So to get us started, let's take a few minutes to highlight those pivot points or decision points that you've made along the way that got you to your current position. And Margaret, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. Sure, um, thank you. And I'm, I'm happy, happy to be here with you all. I'm trying to pretend that we're actually sitting around a table instead uh, and look forward to the days so when we do that again. Um, well, I don't know if you all uh, know what Ben Franklin is, so I'm gonna do a quick, uh, start there because it's relevant to the choices I've made, but I am uh, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives of Ben Franklin Technology Partners, which is a really uh, pioneering organization that grew out of Pennsylvania. And there are uh, organizations somewhat like us now across the country. One of the things that people never knew about 
um, what PA created. We are the most active seed stage investor in our region, in our state. And um, the Ben Franklins, we have sister organizations across the state, are really among the most seed, active seed stage investors in the nation. And we invest in those technologies uh, that grow young businesses. And that's kind of relevant to why I'm there uh, and what uh, kind of our pivotal points in my professional life. Um, one of the things I learned early is there are lots of ways to make change. And I started in the federal government and quickly learned, you know, there are other things other than regulating that you can do. And I think that's going to come out in the conversations we have this morning, um, that wherever you sit, whether you own a cafe or run a civic organization, there are tools you have from what you do that can make positive uh, community and civic change. Uh, another key learning I had very, very early, and I've continued and I think we'll talk to in some ways again, is that always in life, I've chosen the professor, not the course. I have worked uh, in Philadelphia with some of our, uh, our city's greatest leaders, um, either as my boss, uh, Graham Finney, who some of you are, are young enough, unfortunately you don't know, but I'm so sorry for you that you don't. Uh, Jeremy Nowak, um, both of those uh, uh, are Philadelphia award winners. So I wasn't the only one who thought that and Roseanne Rosenthal, who I joined Ben Franklin to join, who is a real uh, trailblazer herself, and really got that impact investing and regional growth could use all sorts of tools. Um, and so I'll start with, there are lots of ways to make change, and I will end with the same. There are lots of ways to make change. If what we're about is how we grow the pie, uh, and the pie being the strength and vitality of Philadelphia, any tool in your toolkit can either be about what you want for yourself or be about something that matters um, for Philly and for the region. Great, thank you so much. Eleanor? Sure. Um, so I, I think, you know, sort of just to respond to the question and, and, and the one of the big questions I think um, I often hear from folks who are just starting out around uh, how to make change was one of the sort of key issues I really wrestled with, which is sort of like the public sector versus the private sector decision point. Um, so just briefly in terms of my background, when I, I came to Philadelphia for business school and when I graduated, I needed to make that kind of key decision. And I really worried about whether I needed sort of one more turn in the private sector in order to have credibility ultimately in the public sector, which is where I wanted to end up. Um, certainly a through line for me is a great sense of impatience and urgency. <laughs> and, uh, and at that time, actually, Bill Hankowski had just left uh, PIDC to run Liberty Property Trust. And I had offers in hand from both the city and from Liberty Property Trust. And his counsel really gave me the reassurance I needed um, to take the first step and start in the public sector, which is really where my heart was and where I wanted to be. And, you know, he was really right. So later uh, I served as the deputy commerce director under Mayor Nutter and my mentor at the time left to go run the London Olympics project. <clears throat> and I made the decision that I was ready for a transition myself, which really led to this incredible transition to the energy and environmental um, industry. And so then I ended up in the private sector after all, uh, ultimately leading for Veolia North America, the market development functions. So I just got to do extraordinary work and at that time sort of in other cities was um, sort of a pressing need for me sort of to, to do work outside of Philadelphia. Um, so got to work on infrastructure climate resiliency in Houston and Boston and New Orleans. Um, you know, really complex biodiversity projects at all our water and wastewater treatment plants in North America and sort of complex environmental uh, services type projects like sulfuric acid regeneration and, and all sorts of things related to um, environmental services. So just, you know, sort of a great experience there that really used the skills I had learned in the public sector. Um, and after about a decade in that energy and environmental industry, then I really wanted to return back to Philadelphia um, for a more focused local level impact. So I left Veolia for this leadership role in Pew's Philadelphia program. 
uh, which where I've been serving for about two years. So I, I would say sort of the through line um, in terms of just my background is sort of the, those sets of decisions around public versus private and how do you, how and where do you make change and sort of um, the skills that are, that really complement one another um, from each of those kinds of industry perspectives. Thank you, Eleanor. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Um, I feel people writing questions feverishly as we speak and we'll be able to get to all of those in the chat room. Let's move on to um, Jen DeVore, president and co-founder of Better Civics. Hi, Jen. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so my, my entire life has been pivots. Um, starting in high school, I was a terrible student. I actually almost failed out of school. Um, and it wasn't until my senior year that I took a civics class that really changed my life. It made me more invested in my community. Um, it drew a lot of frustration, understanding how government works and how complicated it is, and um, sometimes by design and how unfair that is. And it really drove my passion to turn my life around, become a better student. I got my grades up just enough to be uh, accepted into the University of the Arts, which brought me to Philadelphia. Um, graduating from there with marketing and communications degree, I spent the first few years of my career working in advertising in like a very like Mad Men uh, scenario. Um, and while it was a great experience and I had a strong work ethic, it made me realize that I wanted to be doing more with my time and my energy to move Philadelphia forward, to help my neighbors um, and to really kind of be involved in the, the social discourse happening in the city. And so I pivoted then um, by leaving my job uh, with no plan about five months before my wedding. And I just went with my gut instinct and knew that I needed to pivot and needed to put, put my energy into um, a different place. And then I got into the nonprofit sector. Um, and from there, I worked at organizations like the Sustainable Business Network, where I first connected with CCPA. And then I spent seven years at Campus Philly as director of partnerships, helping um, college students uh, that were both from Philadelphia, first generation college students and those new to the region um, find their home here, just like I had. Um, and while all this was going on in my career, I was becoming more involved in my South Philadelphia neighborhood. I was a block captain, I still am today. Um, I've been an election poll worker, a committee person. Um, you know, it started with me being uh, the person on my block who was good with the computer for all of my elderly neighbors. And it just really was able to um, bring a lot of excitement and, and really see a lot of significant change on a very small scale when you just look at, you know, your individual block. Um, and then from there, I started to realize, why don't we take the skills that we use in marketing and communications, which is what my formal background's in, like dynamic messaging, good design, um, things that we use to sell energy drinks. Why don't we do that to sell civic engagement and, and to get people at the polls and not just telling people to vote, but really explaining why they should vote and how it affects their block and their day to day. Um, and so I actually quit my job again <laughs> uh, with the support of the Campus Philly team. I worked, you know, Margaret mentioned, you know, taking the professor, not the course. And for those of you that know Dr. Deborah Diamond, she's an incredible inspiration to me. And to work under her for seven years was an amazing experience. And with her support, I was able to run for city commissioner, a citywide office um, that oversees all elections in Philadelphia. This was in 2019 before Pennsylvania was at the, the center of the universe of politics uh, as we saw this past, uh, this past November. Um, so I ran for office. I didn't win, but I ran a great race. I was endorsed by the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, which for me as someone that started as someone who almost failed out of high school to make that jump was incredibly validating and uh, meaningful to me. Um, and then when I didn't win, you know, running for office and not winning, it's like running off a cliff and jumping. And then you kind of just like fall a foot. <laughs> and so I was left with this decision. Well, what do I want to do? And I realized that um, I could still do the work that I wanted to do. I didn't need to be an elected official to do that. And so myself and my colleague, Megan Smith, 
Last year, we co-founded Better Civics. And what we do is we bring, uh, Better Civics brings our expertise in marketing and dynamic messaging to create information uh, and educational resources about how government works, how to hold our elected officials accountable, what's on the ballot and how it affects us day to day. And then we deliver that information through community organizations, civic associations, social service agencies, because they already have that trusted um, audience. And so that, that's my story and that's where I am today. And who knows what my next pivot will be. <laughs> Who knows, but we're all watching. We're all very intrigued, that's for sure. That's fantastic. I love that you that you said take Philly like block by block because mm -hmm. we're a city of neighborhoods. And exactly. Block is completely different, you know? Um, oh, fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll be getting back to you with some questions, I'm sure. Jovita, nice to see you again. Jovita Hill, Executive Director, Office of Engagement for Women, City of Philadelphia. Let's talk about your pivot points and decision points, because you've been in a couple of different fields as well. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, the last time um, we were engaged, it was audio. So I am so happy to be able to put a face, um, name, and, and your personality, which is big. And so I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm very happy that you're the moderator, Marilyn. And I'm really happy about that question because it's a question that kind of informs um, the entire trajectory of my career. Um, I came of age at a time when there was the convergence of the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the reproductive rights movement, um, the anti-war movement, and all of these movements um, really called me. And so, and, and influenced um, this whole learning for social justice. And so if we were going to talk about a through line, um, that through line would be social justice. Um, whether it was when I was a journalist, um, I, uh, worked for the oldest black newspaper in the city, the Philadelphia Tribune, as the arts and entertainment editor. Um, I worked for PBS as an associate producer for Black Perspective on the News. Um, I was a broadcaster. I was um, a reporter at WDAS AM FM radio. Um, so that all of these things, I had my own PR firm. Um, and my own film and, and, and video production company. But at the heart of all of this, um, I would have to say it was still social justice even today. And it also um, brought me to the point where um, I had to give up, like Jan, I have a lot in common with Jan. Um, for 17 years, I was the committee person in my neighborhood and I did a lot of GOTV. Um, also, in, in that same period of time, um, I also realized that civic engagement gives you a lot of social and political capital. And so when you are civically engaged, just like Jan, um, you, get, you get a whole lot out of being engaged in your community and engaged in, 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 in the things that you do. So, um, I, so what I would have to say is that um, that whole idea of social justice, I remember the first candidate I volunteered for when I was 14 years old, it was because that candidate was the anti-war candidate. And so um, I also was in that first breed of 18 year olds in 1972 that had the right to vote. Um, I could not vote in the primary because uh, when Shirley Chisholm was running for president and I couldn't vote in the primary, but in 72 that fall, I voted in my first presidential election. And I have to say since 1972, I have never ever missed an election since. So the, the electoral process has always been important to me. And, and I guess some, uh, that's a, a roundabout way of saying I, you're 
because of civic engagement and social justice. I did know that when I was about 10 years old, I liked seeing my name in print. The first thing I ever wrote for publication was in highlights for children. And I've been a writer ever since. <laughs> That's awesome. And you know, unbeknownst to you, Jovita, you've kind of been a mentor for me because listening to DAS and growing up in Philadelphia, and you know, a lot of other stations, I used to imitate some of the people on air and I wanted to be just like them. And that's how I wound up in radio. Um, my pivot points are too many and I'm not important. It's the panelists, everybody. Um, so let's talk about mentors because Jovita, you were certainly one for me. Has, has there been some folks over the years that have played a significant role for you that you sort of looked up to or admired or respected that helped guide you and your path and your journey? Well, stay with Jovita. You're, um, oh, okay, I was. I, I thought you were going to go around uh, again when... Um, I'm, I'm just throwing a curveball here. We'll go okay, backwards. But, yeah, but I can tell you, um, one of the things that I was grateful for, I never, I never picked a mentor. Mentors picked me. Um, my mentor saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And they kept challenging me to do things that I had never done before. So this particular significant mentor, who is now a lifelong friend of over 50 years, um, when I was still in school, she would have me working on political campaigns, doing press releases um, for uh, campaigns. And then at one point when I started my business, she would throw clients my way. And at many points, I was doing things that I had never done before. Um, and so this was Gwendolyn Johnson Winfrey, who um, for years now has run Imani Business Services. And her clients became my clients. And, um, and she just dragged me along. Everything she was doing, I was doing too. And um, the other impactful mentor to me was the late Linda Waters Richardson of Black United Fund. Um, I had never been a development director before. She made me development director. And before it was all over, I was raising a half a million dollars a year from her tutelage. Everything I know about fundraising, I learned from Linda Waters Richardson. So that's kind of how mentorship happened to me. I'm not sure that it's the traditional mentorship, but it was like, it was people having confidence in me and me having confidence from succeeding at doing things I had never done before. Right, and that's, uh, that's so key in moving forward. Margaret, how about you? Mm -hmm. um, I already mentioned a few bosses who mattered, and I'm sure in every way a boss has the ability to mentor uh, and to model by good and bad, and those are three really wonderful examples. But for me, mentor is really a better verb than a noun. I didn't go out and choose mentors, and I don't have special ceremonies where I then pick a mentee. Um, we have, there are great mentorship programs out there when people are looking for something specific. Uh, and I've been involved in those, but I like thinking about this as a way that we keep things much wider. Um, I don't just get mentored by somebody who is older. I learn a lot from people who are younger. I don't just mentor somebody who I will develop a relationship for the long term, because there's place for some of that serendipity and the ability to kind of understand networks as bigger. Uh, access to capital, we talk about a lot. But in my experience, the access to social networks is just as great of a limiter as anything else. So any way where I can mentor someone who then has access to new worlds or they can mentor me, and again, whether they're you know, 23 or 73, um, and they can mentor me, so I have access to new skills and perspectives. I really do like thinking about this in, in a bigger sense and not something that's so um, limited as a, as a resource. Thank you. Eleanor, do you want to speak to mentorship a little bit? 
I'd just add to what's already been said. Um, you know, I think there is a lot of pressure to have a mentor with a capital M. And, you know, I tend to have sort of a, a, a looser set of folks that I check in with. I like to sort of solicit a range of feedback and points of view. Um, but one person who has served as, a, 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 as one of those advisors is on this call. So Steve Mullen has, um, has been somebody who's, who's served those purposes over the years and likes to um, sort of uh, ingest a note that uh, every bit of advice he's ever offered me, I've done the opposite. But um, uh, at any rate, I think there's a lot of pressure to have a single mentor and sort of that loose collection is, is, is a really useful, um, uh, you know, kind of a cabinet of, of resources and thought partners as you're sort of navigating questions about work or, or personal life. And then I just do want to put in a, also a plug for professional coaching outside of mentoring. Um, I know that's a separate issue, but I think some of the hardest decisions I've had to make um, around professional situations that I've had to navigate have been better done sort of confidentially and with a professional coach who could, could help me navigate those. So um, I think mentors are incredibly useful, but um, that there's actually really no substitute also for, for that um, support by a professional coach when it's needed. Something to think about. Thank you so much, Eleanor. And finally, Jen, we're back to you. Um, it seems like you've been doing pretty well without mentorship. No, <laughs> I absolutely have tons of mentors. Some are you even do? on this call. And you listen to them, I find yeah, that, but go ahead. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, even, you know, thinking back to my story, you know, it was one teacher that, that changed my life, you know, to present information in a dynamic way and to, you know, take the time and sit down and explain things. And then at the University of the Arts, I was lucky enough to have, um, I don't know if you know David Brown, uh, Brown Communications formally, and, you know, everything else he has his hands in was my college professor um, and has you know, helped carry my career throughout uh, the years. Um, I've been, uh, and those, you know, I've, I've had informal mentors, um, you know, people like teachers or colleagues, you know, mentors that are peer mentors um, or even younger, um, you know, with, with, I used to run the internship program at Campus Philly and always learning from people um, that are, you know, just starting out too and how they approach things. Um, I've also benefited from some of those more formal part, uh, leadership programs. Um, I'm a graduate of Leadership Philadelphia's Connectors and Keepers program. Um, I did also receive professional coaching from Leslie Wendell, who's also on this call today through the Women um, Executive Forum um, when they recognized me a few years ago. And, and I do think that having that balance of um, informal and formal mentors plus the professional development. Um, and I think for me, what's really made a difference is having mentors or just people, influential people in my life that are very different from me, um, because it's a great way to have a sounding board. If I'm writing an op-ed or if I'm applying for a grant or a contract, and I can have somebody that has a very different perspective from mine, read through things and talk things out with me, um, it just makes the opportunity more, I think, inclusive and broader. Um, and that's the, the most benefit that I've gotten from my mentors and coaches is just that, that very different perspective. Great. Thank you so much. I just wanted to shout out Hope, who wrote in the comments, David Brown is one of my favorite people. Who mentioned David Brown? I did. I think everyone there that knows David Brown says that about him. <laughs> one of her favorites. So there you go. Um, okay, great. Let's get into it a little bit now. Um, we hate to look back, you know, we're all about moving forward and getting Philadelphia back on track as certainly you guys are committed to that. Um, but this has been an unprecedented year of upheaval. We have never really gone through what we've gone through since March of 2020. So I'd like to, if, if you can, uh, have each of you just share how you managed to get through some of these challenges. And more importantly, if there was an opportunity that presented itself over the last 16 months or so. Margaret, why don't we start with you? 
just to um, get you to okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go more to the second part, but I will first give a shout out to the Wissahickon. Um, this beautiful park we have in Philadelphia was so essential to so many of us over the, this past year. And uh, I hope in many ways that Fairmont Park in general, we were talking earlier about FDR and how beautiful that is now, but that our parks continue to get the kind of support that they need because they were uh, uh, saving grace. And I'm gonna leave some challenges, other stuff, I'll leave that uh, behind for the, for the moment. The striking opportunities though for me were really about um, on the work front, how it used to be challenging to make the connection between the kind of early stage technology investment we do in social impact. And that's why I joined Ben Franklin was to focus on that connection. And it became so um, obvious that whether it's the health technologies that we're so dependent on or digital health tools that all of a sudden the medical establishment and others were really ready to embrace um, educational technology tools. You need better than Zoom to engage uh, educationally. And we have fascinating companies growing in the Philly area. Um, climate change related companies. I mean, the variety of companies in our portfolio, um, some who, that are really, have been really challenged um, and uh, we're not speaking at all, I'm not speaking at all about uh, retail that some of you in this call represent, but some that are really challenged, but others where there's opportunity. And maybe then there's a way that we can make the connection between the kind of innovation growing in Philly and the need to, for capital to grow in Philly. Um, I'm aiming for positive, um, but, uh, on the capital front, we keep lagging, whether it's philanthropic capital, and Eleanor's team, I'm sure, has every bit of data on this, but whether it's for philanthropic capital or other sorts of, kind of catalytic capital that can make a difference in what we deploy in early stage companies, in rebuilding uh, back more equitably, uh, we have so much opportunity here if we figure out, um, if, we, if some gets figured out in Harrisburg, but if some of it just gets figured out in how those of us who have figure where we invest. Um, and so that is an opportunity and that's what I'm on all day, all the time um, in figuring out how do we get more playing out for the strength of this region. And on the um, personal side of it, I think what we've learned is how to be present, that you don't just have to be walking with someone, that we have good imaginations. I can put an AirPod in my ear and go for a walk with someone. And as we've all lost people this year, there's nothing other than that kind of presence. Thank you so much. And thank you for mentioning uh, Fairmount Park. The Conservancy is on with me this Sunday. I think that many of us discovered nature and the importance of just wanting to be outside and um, connect in whatever way we could. So thank you for bringing them up there. It's extraordinary in Philadelphia that we have those options. Margaret, thank you. Eleanor, how about you? Sure. How'd you make it through uh, this crazy last year? Sure, um, my team uh, at Pew, the Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative seeks to reduce poverty through economic opportunity, um, bringing research and policy to those questions, um, which obviously uh, became much more urgent uh, in the pandemic. And I think, um, there was sort of a transformation for us in, in how we work. Um, you know, city leaders were, you know, totally overwhelmed with how to respond to the pandemic. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, smart, effective policymakers who have extremely lean, lean staffs and in sort of a, a, a small set of tools to respond. And I think, there was a lot of noise and sort of trying to identify the path forward was really complicated. And, you know, I think we realized that in some ways our old model where we would um, sort of research and drop a report um, was kind of creating some of that noise, if you will, because, you know, sort of dropping a complex set of research findings and expecting those busy and leanly staffed policymakers to be able to extract the key finding and then act on it is sort of, it, it is a little bit un unrealistic. Um, so we needed to do a much better job of sort of active and responsive policy outreach. So really working with policymakers to understand what is the question they are trying to understand and then helping to answer those questions directly 
And I'd say for us that led to, um, because Philadelphia actually has some of the strictest ethics laws of any city in the country, it is complicated to do that here. Um, So it means entering into technical assistance agreements, publishing more frequently with targeted policy briefs, partnering with other civic organizations or testifying at city council, something we just did actually yesterday and we do quite frequently, Um, but really finding ways to engage much more actively um, and and hear and answer those questions directly and and helping city policymakers act on good data and research, um, you know, under really complicated, uh, you know, uh, set of circumstances. Um, And then just on the personal level, I'd say like, I've got three kids who would have ever thought that we would spend, um, have 454 dinners together. Um, That's what day we're on. Um, And, you know, I think we, you know, to celebrate some of that and the connectedness that came out of that, you know, we're like many, a very busy family and we've just had some really special time together. And I would just say like, we know each other, we're more connected to one another. And, you know, as, you know, horrible and traumatic as all of this has been, I I do want to like hold on to some of that, um, like special ability to celebrate, you know, some found relationships um, with with my kids that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, a great silver lining takeaway. Eleanor, thank you so much. Jen, I guess we just go right to opportunities for you. We know it's, it's been a tough go. Uh, but you certainly found a window of opportunity during the pandemic that you may not have otherwise found. Why don't Absolutely. You... I, yeah, I felt like forced by the universe to, to do something. Um, you know, uh, as Eleanor, I'm also a mom. And so our home life was completely disruptive and chaotic and still kind of is. Um, and so while kind of dealing with that and figuring out virtual school and, you know, it's like, I think any parent on the call can agree. It's like, we have to curate these experiences for our kids every day, uh, when they're home with us. And, and that was certainly taxing, but, um, I don't think that we could have started better civics at a different time. Um, you know, we had the idea to take my campaign for city commissioner, and you know, start to turn it into something shortly after the election. Um, and remember, I had just ran a tough campaign that I didn't win when COVID hit. I was like, I had my hard year. I did that already. This is like oppor- this is supposed to be opportunity for me. And so, um, what ended up just it just happened so organically and so quickly. And I think it's because we had the strong foundation to really just be prepared for the unexpected and meet the moment. But with the presidential election being um, so uh, so intense and new voting procedures in Philadelphia, we were voting by mail uh, for the first time. We had new voting machines. Um, and obviously the digital divide was completely amplified across the city. So we had all these new things happening and no way to really, no traditional ways to really get the word out. And just Better Civics was just kind of born, or I want to use the term bursted out of this time. Um, And it's been hard. And, you know, we wonder every day, is this sustainable? People only want to talk about elections right before an election. And our whole model is to disrupt that and to do this year round. Um, But it's, been great and we've, we've been successful and we, we were able to help a lot of people, um, you know, cast their vote and, and not just around voting, but let their neighbors know about COVID procedures. And once the vaccine came out, we took a lot of inspiration from the way that the Philly census handled uh, this challenge as well. Um, so I, it, it's been hard, but I, I don't think better civics could have come out at a, at a better or bigger time. Yeah, turns out we uh, all do still want to talk about elections because yeah. we're still talking about I it. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's hard. And I'll just like every, I'm sure everyone on this call, not just the panelists, can, it's like every day, it's like, all right, I got to do this. I'm going to focus today. I'm going to get your work done. And it's been hard, but it's been good. Yeah. Great job. Thank you so much. And Jovita, challenges that were tossed uh, your way that you had to overcome. And then, of course, We'd like to know some highlights as well. 
think the most um, poignant part of having to be home um, and working for the past 14 months made me recognize my privilege that I was able to continue working from home um, and mostly without skipping a beat. Um, so many people were suffering. So that privilege, um, I'm reminded of that privilege every single day. And I'm reminded of that privilege every two weeks when I get a paycheck. Um, and also, but personally, um, you know, my son does not live here, but he's here frequently. Um, and as a matter of fact, the first three months, he took a leave of absence so he could be with his parents. And once he went back to work, whenever he came here, he wore a mask. And it blew me away that after his two weeks of vaccination, we were all vaccinated. It was the first time in over a year that I had seen my son's full face um, because he was masked every time he was in our house. And so seeing his full face affected me. And even though we had holidays together, we and he was in the same house with us, we were Zooming meals, holiday meals. He was eating in his room while my husband and I were sitting at the table and we were Zooming so we could eat together. Well, his birthday was last week and we had a family dinner and that warmed my heart. And so work-wise, um, I'm really proud that one of the things we were very engaged, we were for I guess the first several months, my office was putting out the COVID-19 briefings. Uh, we did the um, vaccination sites when they were available, where they were, who was doing them. And we also created a COVID-19 resource guide for women. So our work didn't stop because of the pandemic. Uh, we just had to learn different ways of doing the things that we do. And I guess that's probably something you'll take forward. Absolutely, but I still have to get over. Um, also, um, one of the side effects of the pandemic, I'm a social butterfly, uh, but the side effect is like I've become mild agoraphobic. <laughs> so tomorrow I will be doing, I will be doing an, an outdoor event that I'll be going to, and it'll be the first time I've been practically out of my house. Wow. Yeah. I'm nervous. I, I feel like I used to be everywhere all the time doing everything, and now I'm so completely introverted. Does anyone else feel like that? Are you guys ready to get back into the world? I guess I'd love to know. Margaret? I think it's going to be different. And I think it's gonna be more precious. I think about how after a, um, a fast, you eat a clementine. Boom! And I think that's what it's gonna be for a while. And I hope we seize that as a positive for valuing the connection and what we can do from it. Eleanor, how about you? Uh, I'm ready. I'm You're ready right. to go back to the <laughs> office. I'm ready to, I'm, yes, I am ready. <laughs> Said the mom with three children. I get that. Um, Jen, how about you? I, I'm so extroverted <laughs> that it, this has been so emotionally taxing to not be able to charge my battery and re-energize the way that I used to. Um, so I'm, I'm ready to like go do karaoke and have a beer at a bar soon. <laughs> Eleanor, you can join me if you're ready. <laughs> we could um, go all I'm free at 1030. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to know what the karaoke jam is. And what's your song? I'm not kidding. <laughs> but we'll have to have you on uh, Remarkable Women, Jen, so we can learn more about you and karaoke. Um, I think, do we have time for one more question? I yield to Kate because I could hang on to 
all of you for so long. And I know a lot of people are eager to get with you one-on-one -on -one in the chat rooms. <clears throat> and so I don't want to covet you all to my own. Um, sure, Marilyn, you're, you, we can go as late as 10, 15 if you, if you choose. So you have plenty of time. Let's keep going. All right. So finally, I would ask this. If you had unlimited time and resources, <clears throat> what changes within your purview would you enact in Philadelphia? We're back, we're ready. I'm sure you guys have amazing ideas and we'd like to hear one or two of them. Margaret, you are not muted, so we'll start with you. Great. Um, I'm gonna take purview at really broad, uh, um, meaning magic wand can do it too. Um, one of the wonderful things in this past year is that there, are, there was a big leapfrog in creativity on a lot of fronts. Um, I think philanthropy was far more creative and far faster acting than you typically see um, as, as just one example. Um, donor advised funds are kind of individual's version of philanthropy and there was some more creativity there because donor advised funds are um, essentially charitable dollars that are sitting waiting for our use. And I think they just, we just start to see every, how many pockets of those who have resources could get deployed to making a difference, an equitable regional vitality difference. Uh, and I would put in place every incentive imaginable to make those dollars hit projects and work that can make a social impact difference in our region created, um, it was part of the creation five years ago of Impact PHL, which is a regional alliance focused on kind of growing this impact economy and engaging people in these investments. And I think the time is now, there's tons, there are tons of ways, creative ways to either give, lend or invest your money to have, make a difference uh, here in our region. And I would pull out that wand and get a go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Eleanor, how about you? Sure. Um, I mean, I think the question that I think about a lot, both sort of professionally and personally, is this question of, of what does an inclusive recovery look like um, for Philadelphia? And I think we really need to crystallize our thinking around what do we want uh, future growth to look like? And we need a focused all of government, all of civic sector plan around middle wage job creation for family sustaining jobs in Philadelphia. I think, um, you know, just to sort of frame a little bit of data from recent Pew research, the reality is that Philadelphia was growing jobs. We were at a 30 year high for jobs and we were growing population in Philadelphia. However, that was extremely unevenly distributed, right? That, that growth was, was unevenly experienced by Philadelphia residents. And the job growth that we did have was at, was sort of a U, it was at the high end and at the low end. And the growth that was, um, the job growth at the low end was the job growth that were, were city residents, right? Jobs for city residents. There was no net new growth in the middle. And when we talk about middle wage jobs, that the reason that's important is because in Philadelphia, we still only have 30% of the population with the bachelors. Um, so you need jobs that where you can sort of earn um, sufficient salary to support a family, you know, at that middle number. And that's that number is a median of $23 an hour in Philadelphia. And, and so, you know, it's critically important and we really, um, need to have, I think, that sort of singularity of purpose and plan um, that's shared, you know, more broadly. And I would just say, since you're giving us a magic wand here, that, you know, I think that it, it's not just growing those jobs and creating wealth, but also accelerating the rate of policy change, right? We've had an accelerated set of impacts here, um, and we really need a greater sense of urgency because the decisions that we make as a city over the next two years are really important. Those stimulus funds um, will set the stage for what our recovery looks like. And I think there's just a lack of clarity and focus around that issue. And so that, that, that would be um, uh, 
my magic wish, my, my wish with the magic wand. Thank you, Eleanor. And Jen? Yeah, I mean, I'll speak very specifically to my work with civic engagement in elections. And I, I think everyone needs to understand civics and how our government works and the difference between a state senator and a state representative and how that affects your day to day. Um, we constantly hear that we should vote, but I feel like there's more to be explained as to why we should vote, how to make choices based on our own individual val values and what's important to us and um, you know, hold elected officials and our government more accountable. Um, I think that starts, you know, it'd be, if again, with this magic wand, let's fully fund better civics to do this for everyone in the city um, and, you know, focus on getting civics back in the classroom. But then, you know, at, at our organization, we talk a lot about adult civic education and uh, really giving people the power and the tools and the resources to understand how they can support themselves, ask great questions, um, and really challenge the systems at place. Um, I think the, the hottest take that I have too is lowering the voting age to 16. Um, it's something that I'm incredibly um, passionate about. I actually sit on the board of a national organization called Vote 16 USA that's dedicated to that. Um, and I think it could be a really transformational opportunity to change not just our voter turnout, but really the demand for civic education at an early age if we have our young people voting. Um, I've written about this a bunch of times and most recently in the Inquirer and um, I think I'll end there, but I could continue to go on and on about how to reform this city. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. And Jovita, what's uh, your magic point? Thank you. Oops. I would underscore everything that Eleanor said. If I had this magic wand and, and money were no object, I would use money or those resources um, to bring Philadelphia's families out of poverty. Um, I think that is one of the nagging um, issues um, that whether we're talking education policy, um, economic policy, um, growth policies, all of these things would be improved, health issues would be improved and disparities would be improved if we did not have this persistent poverty rate. And I also, before you know, I, I give up my time, um, a shout out to the Center City Proprietors Association and let them know that the Center City Kitchen Capers has been home for me on weekends for 17 years as a retail associate. So um, many of you on this call may have seen me a weekend or two at Kitchen Capers. Marilyn, when we met in our prep call, um, I think you, this question got within your purview on purpose because there is no question that the first answer for all of us, if we got a, I think it was all of us, we got, when we got a, a magic wand would be um, quality public education for all Philadelphia kids. I think it gets at all of the things we did say. Um, and so since we didn't get to say it, I have to say it, uh, a fair funding formula uh, for, for schools, but it relates to every question you asked because never have we seen more clearly the inequities than we've seen this year. You know, where even just trying to get kids graduations is becoming such an excitement. You see proms in the suburbs, you see everything in the, you know, independent schools. And those are all the wrappings around um, what's just inequitable. So if we can use four magic wands, we'll take that. And then we'll the <laughs> other things using regular mortal skill tools and things, but uh, I couldn't let it go without speaking to it. Well, speaking of mortal skills, you know, we're, y you all are brilliantly influencing and affecting change through policy in the city of Philadelphia. But for those of us um, showing up at our workplace every day in our community and in our city, what do you recommend we do? Eleanor, let's begin with you. Um, 
may I defer to Jen? Cause I'd love to say, and, and, and what she said, so. <laughs> Jen, it's I all was, you. I was just thinking, this is the one prep question I didn't prepare for. <laughs> no, I mean, I think there, there's a couple things, right? I mean, obviously everyone should vote at every election. There are no off-year elections. We don't believe in that here at Better Civics. But um, I think it's about, you know, talking to your neighbors, getting involved with what's happening in your community, whatever that community may look like. Um, and really not just, I mean, it sounds cliche, but not accepting the status quo, you know? Um, an example is, you know, this past election, we voted for judges, right? How hard is it to vote for judges? It's insane. There's so many candidates. People aren't given the right information to know what the different courts do and what their roles are and what qualifications we look for for judges. And so rather than just going into the polls and selecting the top three or, or not voting at all, um, you know, start to ask these questions and dig deeper. And, and there are some really fantastic resources. Um, obviously, Better Civics is one of them. Uh, Committee of 70, you can't talk about this work without talking about them. Um, tons of community groups and civic associations. So it's, you know, I, I encourage everyone to, to ask questions um, and, and really make sure that you're informed um, about how your local government and your local politics, and that doesn't have to necessarily be partisan. It's just, you know, understanding the day-to-day -day of Philadelphia and how that works. Um, and definitely, you know, stay in touch with Better Civics and uh, you can go to our website at bettercivics.org. <laughs> But uh, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, I think just, you know, to speak from my experience, it's, it's talking to your neighbors and really taking a look about what's going on and asking yourself, do you fully understand it? And if not, what are you going to do about that? Be involved, be engaged, for sure. Jovita? That reminds me, I have been also involved in my civic association uh, for over 20 years, and I've been an officer. I continue to serve on the board. And I'm so embarrassed because last night was our annual meeting for the first time um, it was via Zoom. And I brought up this persistent question to our council person about this stop sign that we've been trying to get for two and a half, maybe three years. Well, because I had not been out of my house, the stop sign was put up a couple weeks ago. I was, I was so terribly embarrassed, but um, I said all that to say that being involved in your civic association, being involved in the life of your community, being involved in the life of your workplace. Um, and, you know, I had mentioned before I had been a committee person also in Center City. And someone asked me, well, what does it take to be a good committee person. And my answer is always be a good neighbor. And so that um, it's not just about voting, it's about the life of your community. And so that's what I would tell people, become involved in the life of your community. Great advice, great takeaway. And Margaret? I've learned that it's really good when you don't go first. Um, Eleanor, <laughs> that was brilliant. Uh, I think it really, it's been captured by um, these two before me, but I would think I'd uh, suggest that any of the about 50 of us who've been on this call, imagine that you are invited to be on this panel pinned instead of just with your white name in black box next week. And what do you want to be saying? So how are you? Um, how are you knowledgeable? What do you read? How are you data driven? Um, how do you know enough? And how do you find ways that you get out of your lane and you use your voice? Um, because the, my fear is as we insulated, an insular can mean one thing. Insulated is great, right? We want our homes to be insulated. Insular is not so good. Uh, and how do we step out and realize that we're better together uh, in whatever way you want to do it? Because all four of us are so different in what we've chosen to do and presume that whichever the next four that show up here are the ones that are on the panel next week. How do you want to speak about what role you have? And there's certainly more coming up. <clears throat> you can check the CCPA website and see who's next. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
You guys, I, I this is I'm blown away by all four of you. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this day. I know there's a lot of people who are eager to get with you one on one. We do have that question, comments. Um, thanks to everybody who's been putting some things in there. I've been trying to keep an eye on that. Um, but if we didn't get to your question, one on one will certainly work. And um, I just personally want to thank you for. Um, I feel more ready to enter the world knowing you four are in it. So thank you so much. I'm going to send it back to, I think, Ben, who's going to take over. And there's going to be another swooshing, another whooshing. They're going to take you away and put you in some individual chat rooms. But thank you so much.